Hey, uh, glad you guys are here. My name is Pastor Russ. We are excited uh, that you have chosen to take some time out of your Christmas season to open the Bible and learn more about Jesus with us. You're probably wondering if you are maybe your first time or you've not been here in a couple of weeks, why are there toilet plungers on the stage? Well, <laughs> see, this represents a lot of what the holidays are like around here, at least in my family. It's meant to be a season of peace and tranquility, but my family seems to have a bone in their body that hates peace and tranquility. I don't know if you've noticed that. It's like if we're together in Applebee's, we've got to cause a scene because, you know, if everything is peaceful at Applebee's, we need to make sure there's a rat in a cob salad so that we can turn it upside down uh, because we, we struggle with peace. And, and I would submit to you uh, that this is not a my family problem but that in various ways we all are defunct and dysfunctional because of sin. And there's this consistent uh, dissatisfaction that seems to rest in the hearts of man that causes war and lust and division and uh, anger and fighting and quarrels that we have to deal with. And the truth is, none of you, although this, for some of you you have tried it for the last two years, you can't live in complete isolation from people. I mean, you can live in most isolation from people. That's how Woodruff existed. You know, we wanted to live away from society and people. But, but you're going to have to interact with people. And when you interact with people, the problem is, is they are in time, given the opportunity, going to be dysfunctional, going to be sinful, and no one sins in a bubble. My sin affects you. Your sin affects others. And at the end of the day, we have to get better at dealing with dysfunctional people, and what we get is a Bible that is filled with stories of dysfunctional families who, by the grace of God, who, by the grace of God, see him do something wonderful in spite of themselves. And I believe that we can relate to that story, that God does good work in spite of me most of the time, that usually it's not me in flow or in rhythm with the work of God, but it's often in spite of me that the work and the goodness and the fruit of God comes into my life to bring good works and good fruit through my life to my community around me. And so we wanted to take some time this holiday season, which is the busiest time of the year for the police department, apparently, to talk about family dysfunction and the good news of God's work in dysfunctional families. Last week, we'd opened it up by looking at our first father and mother, Adam and Eve, and we looked at this idea of something called boundaries boundaries. It's property line. It's you taking an account for what you are responsible for and not taking ownership for other people's dysfunctional attitude, behavior, uh, cycles of life. It's, it's you recognizing that I'm in control of my words and I'm in control of my decisions and I have to live with the consequences of those things. But at the end of the day, I can help you with your decisions. I can help you when it comes to your struggles in life, but I'm not your savior. I am not your hero and I can't fix you because I can't fix myself and I need a savior to do it for me and I believe he's good enough to do it for you. And so we ask some hard questions. Do you have good family boundaries that start with good personal boundaries in your life. Before God said it's not good for man to be alone, he first established boundaries in Adam's life, a garden to work in, a layout of that garden and how to protect his future family that would live within it. And what we see is Adam not accepting the boundaries that God has given him and instead allowing his family to cross those lines and walk into destruction and difficulty, which has led to the entire world experiencing the weight and impact of sin in their lives. Now, today we're going to move on a few hundred or a lot of years ahead into a family that has got a father named Isaac, a mother named Rebecca, and two sons named Jacob and Esau. The story picks up in Genesis chapter 25. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to open up your Bible with me, and let's look at this uh, struggling to function family and God's good work that he does through them. Genesis chapter 25, this story opens up in verse 19 with a disappointed husband in a familiar affliction. It's a disappointed husband who has a familiar affliction. If you're taking notes on titles of the sermon, I just want to make sure that you maybe write down the title. The title is How to Jack Up Your Family, Part 1. <laughs> so if you're looking for, like, how do we really amp it up? Like, how do we ensure the cops get a show? Just do what they do. Verse 19. This is the account of the family of Isaac, the son of Abraham. When Isaac was 40 years old, he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Padan Aram, 
who, and the sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. So we get a general introductory here, but there's a lot to it. There's no details that the Bible includes that aren't meant for your edification or for you to know more about the story. And so we're told about a guy named Isaac who's the son of Abraham. Some of you have sang his song. He was a father. He had many. Had many. Had father. Okay. And you are. And so, so let's just... Now, now, half the room's going, what's happening? <laughs> the other half just grew up in a, a Sunday school with felt more presentations where they drilled this stuff into our heads and everything had a song. And then we replaced that with vegetables <laughs> that sing. Isaac was the son of Abraham. That's an important detail. We're going to touch on that in just a moment. On top of that, uh, Isaac marries a woman named Rebecca, and Rebecca is from a different country. And that's an important detail, too, because there's a son in this story named Jacob who's going to get one up on his brother Esau, and as a result of it, is going to have to go and hide for 20 years with his uncle. He's going to marry his cousins, but things were different back then. It's, it's not as weird as it seems. And for some of you, that's not weird at all. So... But that, that detail is included as well. So we are introduced to a guy named Laban, who will be a major story factor that we'll talk about in the weeks to come. Then we get this familiar uh, affliction, this disappointment that's going on. They get married, he's 40 years of age, and his wife is unable to have children. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. Now, don't let the Bible jack you up in the way that you think about God. Because you read a prayer and a solution that all happen in one verse. And most of life is not a prayer and a solution that happens in one verse. In fact, most of life is a prayer followed by some doubts about that prayer, followed by trying to pray that prayer better, trying to followed by doubting whether or not you are even being heard in that prayer, followed by crying out, followed by tears, followed by apathy and indifference, followed by I ain't even talking about it anymore, followed by, well, maybe I'll pray about it because the preacher says something about it again, followed by a little bit of hope, followed by some dashed hopes again, followed by I thought we'd be here by now, why are we still in this? And sometimes that's one verse. Because they don't time step these things with saying, okay, this, this was, he prayed, at 11 o'clock, and by 11.35, the prayer was answered. That's not what's going on in the story. You see, we are first introduced to this affliction. Rebecca is barren, and she cannot have children. Infertility is always painful. But let us consider the pain that it must have caused Isaac and Rebecca uniquely. Genesis chapter 12, Abraham speaking with God, it says this, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, The Lord said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. Now, big promise. Who's carrying the continuation of the promise? Isaac. And some of you know what this is like. You're born to highly successful parents. They've been gifted by God, blessed by God, and now you carry the burden of their calling. Whether or not you want it or not, whether or not you want to walk in it or not, you deal with the shadow of dad. You deal with the shadow of mom, and it weighs on you. You see, the promise was that Abram was going to be the father of many nations, yet when he dies, he has one child that's in the promise. That one child that's in the promise of God building a great nation that's going to bring the whole redemptive story to creation is a guy named Isaac. It lays on his head. Now, what else do we know about this? He's going to be the father of many nations, but his wife cannot have kids. So how do you have a nation if you can't have one child? Can you imagine the doubt? Can you imagine the frustration, the discouragement that comes out during this time? Now, here's what you need to know. And this is like a crash course lesson in how God works that comes in this story. The truth about God's promise is this. God has never called anyone 
who did not have a weight that followed receiving the promise. When God promises something to you, it usually requires a season of waiting. That's not a season of waste. It's God preparing you to not idolize the gift that he's going to give you. It's God preparing you to actually carry the calling he's going to put on you. It's God preparing you to mature. Look, Joseph is going to rise up and save the entire nation of Israel in a few chapters. And he sees his brothers bowing down to him and his parents bowing down to him. And he thinks it's going to be about his significance. So God has a crash course of waiting that awaits him. So you know what he does? He gets thrown into a pit. He gets sold for boss McGum to slaves, to a slave traders. He's sold into Egypt. Things get better. The very next thing we read about Joseph after being sold into slavery is that the Lord was with Joseph in the waiting as he held the promise that he had yet to receive. After he rises up in Potiphar's house, things are going great. Potiphar's wife corners him, grabs his tunic from him. He runs and streaks like uh, Ray, whatever his name is, through the house. I can't remember who was the guy I remember from back in the day. It's Ray Stevens. Amen. There's still a redneck in the room. (laughs) And he's thrown into the pokey. He goes in the pokey. Two guys are thrown in that are from uh, Pharaoh's court. He translates their dreams. For one of them, they didn't want the translation because off with your heads. The other one is restored. And he asks them, don't forget me. When you get up there with Pharaoh and you remember the guy that translated this dream and it is going well with you, remember me who has done nothing that's in this prison. We're told even in prison, though, the Lord was with them. And even when he was forgotten by the guy that was restored, the Lord was with them until Pharaoh had a dream that he couldn't translate. And the guy remembered and Joseph was put in front of him. You see, it's never in your time that the promise of God comes through. It's always in God's time. You see, promises from God are given by God and they are achieved by God. So God doesn't give you a promise so that you can get busy with something to do. The promise is never built on what you can do, what you will do. It's built on what God's saying he's going to do in you or for you or through you or around you. And so it's given by God, therefore it has to be instituted from God. God does not give you his promise to give you something to do, but so that your faith can grow in the confidence of what God has determined to do. So that as you're walking in it, you're like, oh, God already told me about this one. God already promised this to me. I I can receive it with joy because I know that this is what God does. He's already promised that this is the way in which he would work in my life. Let me remind you, God never gives a promise because he owes it to us, but because he is gracious towards us. The promises of God are signs of his grace, not signs of his debt. He doesn't do it because you've performed well, because you've made it on the good list, or you're not on the naughty list. He gives promises based on his character and his grace, and he blesses us with his grace with the promises that he extends to us. You see, if the promise of God came from God, it will have to be instituted by the power of God. If the promise came from God, it will not be your power, but God's power that institutes it in your life. Now, let's talk around this a little bit more. Isaac's mother, Sarah, and his father, Abraham, kind of a big deal in the Bible, had the same problem that Isaac and Rebekah have. They could not have a child, yet they were promised to be the father of, of a kingdom of people that would give God glory and fill the earth. So what does Abraham and Sarah do in their waiting? They try to institute God's promise by their work, with their impatience. So what ends up happening? Well, she comes up with an idea that I'm sure none of you see problems coming with. She takes a maidservant and says, hey, this ain't happening, so why don't you just sleep with her and we'll call it ours? I and mean, this is straight off talk show TV. So what do you end up with? Well, magically, Sarah sees Ishmael, gets envious of the woman in which Abraham was with, and as a result of it, begins to like hate her and despise the child. And all this division begins to break out in the family. All because they tried to institute God's plan in their time and not God's time. All because they tried to pick up what they thought was God's call in their life as something that they should do apart from the power of God in their life. One of my favorite preachers says the biggest problem with the American church today are the people of God trying to do the work of God without the spirit of God. And for a lot of us, that's where we're at. Yes, God's promised you things in your life. No, it is not your job to institute those things. It's your job to cling to Jesus. It's your job to wait on Jesus. It's your job to have confidence and expectation in Jesus. And if you've got to wait until you're 80 before the child of promise comes to you, then you wait till you're 80 
journey in faith and you don't do what Abraham and Sarah did and try and go outside of God to do the work of God and think that it's going to somehow be honoring to God. You see, there's a whole lot of dishonorable stuff in a lot of our families because God has a promise on our family and we're trying to go around him to fulfill the promise in our family. You see, God has not called you to be a move of him. He's called you to be in, wor- in rhythm and work with him. And at the end of the day, I don't want to talk about moves of God and then try and make them up and manufacture them myself. Instead, I want to be a move of God because I'm surrendered to the work of God. Your job in the equation is to submit your life to the work of God, to the hand of God. Luke 9, 23, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. Get yourself out of the way so that God's promise can come in in through your life. You take up your cross and you follow him. And the word is daily, daily. Your job is to die to yourself, get out of the way, and submit to God in the waiting. Some of you guys right now in your life have a promise. God is going to do it because he is gracious, because he is good. It will not be in your timing. It will be in his timing. And it will come with probably a season of waiting that you are not anticipating. But let me promise you this. About everybody we see in the Bible that has a promise of God on their life has a season of waiting where God is working, preparing them for it. You've got a guy named Joseph. How about David? Remember him? Ever heard of him? Little king in the backwoods of nowhere gets anointed to be king. Next thing you read about David after he's anointed to be king is what? He's back in the field taking care of his father's sheep. There's no parade There's no immediate rise to the kingdom. In fact, there's going to be a long process of waiting as he serves the current king, who's the defunct king, who the Spirit of God is not on the king, as he waits on God to elevate him to be the king that God has called him to be. I mean, the entire Christmas season is a season of waiting on the promise of God. I mean, for thousands of years, God called his shot in great detail in advance. If you go to the book of Isaiah, it speaks of the place in which Jesus would die, it, or, excuse me, in which he would be born, and it speaks of the place in which he would die, both in advance, hundreds or thousands of years, 900 years before we get to our New Testament, the book of Isaiah being written. And so hundreds of years in advance, they're waiting on this Messiah, who on his shoulders, the government will increase, not decrease. His reign will come and establish what is broken and wrong in this world to turn it upside down. But what they get after the promise of God God is a weight, and most of them never see the fulfillment of the promise. But does God come through? Every time. Is God on time? All the time. And as a result of it, what we have is a story that reminds us that though we are in seasons of waiting in various ways in our life, there is a God who we can trust with confidence in every promise that he has made to us in our lives. You see, there's a gift in your weight. We don't like to talk about it, and we don't like to wait. But right now, there's a gift in your weight in what God is doing in your family. There's a gift in your weight in what God is doing in your marriage. There's a gift in your weight. How many of you have (laughs) dreaded a current season of life only to look on it several years later and talk about how that was such a simpler and more beautiful time, how there was just so much good (laughs) that was going on? And, and, and you almost wish you could go back to yourself in that moment and go, hey, you're complaining about this, but trust me, it doesn't get more simple from here. In fact, a blessed life by God is a complex life to live. And if God is blessing your life, it's going to grow in its complexity. So enjoy the simplicity of your weight. Look at what happens in the weight for Isaac. Verse 21, Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife, because she was unable to have children. And I love the word. He pleaded with the Lord. That doesn't mean he had like a singular moment of prayer. That means there was a season of crying out to God. So in the way, what did Isaac get familiar with? He got familiar with crying out to God, with being in the presence of God, with turning to God in his time of need. What else happened as a beautiful gift in the way? On top of that, who did he plead for? His wife. God softened his heart towards Rebecca. God, God, God gave him a season to serve her in prayer. You see, many a husband has never known a season of prayer over their own spouse and wife because we've been too quick to run to the next thing instead of stopping in what's not right and bringing it before God on behalf of the people that we love on a consistent basis. You see, the weight drove Isaac to sincere prayer to God, which grew Isaac in relationship with God, and it gave him a keen recognition of his need for the grace and intervention of God. He couldn't make this change. He couldn't make a difference. So whenever God moves in his life, he can't claim that it was his work that 
takes the credit because he was waiting on God's work and knew it was only by God's work that he could have what he's had. Many of you have forgotten more miracles than some will experience. All because you've not taken the time in your wait to mark and note your helplessness apart from the hand of God being at work on your behalf. Am I preaching to a wall? Are you awake out there? See, see, the, the weight is actually a gift. It's, it's not a punishment. It's a gift. What was promised to him was something he was powerless to make happen. And the weight drove him into dependence on God's intervention, which is what God desires in all seasons of our life, that we would depend on him. It made him tenderhearted towards his wife, Rebecca, as he prayed for her, recognizing his inability to help her in his own power. So the story goes on after giving us this little introduction into this big problem. And in verse 22, it moves rather quickly forward but the two children struggled with each other in her womb so she went to ask the lord about it why is this happening she asked why is this happening she asked the lord told her the sons in your womb will become two nations from the very beginning the two nations will be rivals one nation will be stronger than the other and your older son will serve your younger son and when the time came to give birth, Rebecca discovered that she did indeed have twins. The first one was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat, so they named him Esau. Then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so they named him Jacob. Isaac, Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were, okay, 40 when they get married, she's bearing, and, and we just made the point, he pleaded with the Lord. How long did it take? 20-ish years. Some of you haven't even cracked the first five years of the wait. So you're like, well, I want to do this while I'm young. Well, well young's your perception, not God's perception. I mean, God makes an 80-year-old woman named Sarah look really attracted to Pharaoh. So, I mean, like, if God can keep you young, even in your 80s, and bring children to promise, and, like, like, stop arguing with God over his timeline for your biological clock. <laughs> so look. Here's what I want you to see. It's simple. It's not complex. Rebecca has this war going on within her womb, and she doesn't know what's happening within her family. So this is the simplest point of the sermon. It's not complex, but it'll change your family. She doesn't understand what's going on within her family, so what does she do? She goes to the Lord about it. Some of y'all have gone to Dr. Dobson. Some of y'all focused on your family. Some of y'all have gone to Dr. Phil and everybody else on TV trying to figure out what you don't understand about your family. But the one thing you've not done is you've not gone to the Lord about what you don't understand within your family. Now, there's a lot of ridicule that we could give anybody that we read about in the Bible that's not named Jesus, and there's going to be the fair share of why would you do that as a mom that comes later for Rebecca? And why would you do that as a dad that comes for Isaac? But my point is simply this. Rebecca didn't know what was going on in her family, so instead she decided to go to God about it. The Hebrews suggest that the quarreling going on within her stomach was a violent internal commotion, a warlike battle that was happening between the two kids in her womb. As if the unborn children have been dashing against one another in her womb. She doesn't understand what she should do, so she does what the Bible calls all of us to do when we don't know what's happening. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for, he doesn't turn you away for going, I don't get it. I don't understand it. Maybe I'm supposed to have read it by now and picked up on it, but I'm struggling to understand, God, why me, why us, why here, why now? And God goes, yeah, I, I welcome that. I, I don't deter you from that. I don't deter you from bringing it before. I, I welcome, I invite, I enjoy, I call for that. And so the call here is that you would come to God and you would request of God the things that do not make sense in your life, asking for wisdom. On top of that, we're given the detail. When she asked God, the Lord told her, verse 23, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the nations will be rivals and one nation will be stronger than the other and the older son will serve your younger son. And when the time came to give birth, Rebecca discovered that she did have twins. 
What's he saying? Okay, here, here's the deal. You on the surface think you're just having a baby. But I'm actually giving you two nations. You think on the surface it's one thing. But in reality, it's so much more than you've expected it to be. You thought this was about your arms being full. But this is about the earth being full. You thought this was about you getting something that made you lonely. But this is actually about me filling a, a world to carry my story forward so that no one will be without me because I don't want anyone to live life without Emmanuel, the one I'm sending that's going to come through Jacob, the scoundrel, the second, the younger that's going to come in. You see, r right now, some of you think your promise is just about your prosperity or your promise is just about you getting what you lack or what you need within your soul. At the end of the day, I just want to take a moment and remind you that what God is doing in his promises is so much bigger than you. It is so much greater than you can expect or anticipate or predict. When God moves, it doesn't simply affect a generation, it affects generations. And what he is doing right now in your life through his promise is not simply setting you up with a better life, but it's setting up generations that will know of the promise and the goodness and the work of God, and your story becomes an example to them of the faithfulness of God as they wait on the future promises of what he will do in their life. Oh, it's way better than you want to give me credit for, because that's what God... <laughs> God was at work doing something greater than she knew or could expect and anticipate. And within it, we get kind of a detailed outline of what God does when he works. There's three things I want you to see. I'm going to be quick about it. You ready? The answer is telling of how most stories work on this side of eternity when God moves. Number one, the story is hopeful. The story is hopeful. Verse 23, it says, And the Lord told her, The sons in your womb will become two nations. It's hopeful. You don't have one son from your barrenness. You have two that's called efficiency. You get two for nine months of suffering, not two for 18 plus months of suffering. So it's hopeful. The sons in your womb will become two nations. Number two, it's going to be painful, though, because it says in verse 23 that from the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. So you, good news, you've got two sons. The difficult news, it's going to be really tough to get them to get along. They're going to be different. Number three... When God moves, it's usually hopeful, it's usually painful, and number three, it's usually unusual. It says, one nation will be stronger than the other, and your older son will serve the younger son. That's not how this worked back then. The older son got everything. The younger son got a few things and was under kind of a subservient to the older brother. And in this story, before it's ever happened and played out, God says, no, no, no. It's going to be hopeful. There's two kids, not one. It's going to be painful. They're going to be rivals of each other. There's a lot of family pain that's going to come in this story because of that rivalry. Jacob's going to trick Esau out of his blessing. Jacob's going to be convinced that he can't be blessed as Jacob, so he'll disguise himself with his mother's counsel as Esau and steal the blessing from Isaac. As a result of that, Rebekah will never hug her son again. He'll be sent off to Laban. She'll die and be buried in the family tomb. 20 years later, she'll come back. They'll restore. They'll have a great relationship. But the Israelites and the people of uh, Esau will go on to be rivals and rival nations against each other. And we'll read about the rivalry and the pagan worship that Esau's people and their legacy go on to worship instead of the one true God. And as a result of it, the big mess that comes out of all of this story. But in the entirety of it, God is pointing to the fact that he is going to work for an unusual good in it. A good that she can't understand and won't necessarily comprehend. Something she may not have actually seen in her life. And here's what I want you to get. When God moves in your life, it's hopeful, it's often painful, and it's definitely unusual. How do you know you got God working in your life? Well, there's hope, and there probably shouldn't be. There's pain, and you probably don't expect it to be if God's near. And it's unusual because when God works, he doesn't go the way men would go about doing things. Where do you get this from? Is it just a one-off story like this? No, no, no. There's a guy named Saul. He becomes Paul, right? He receives an interaction, an encounter with God in Acts chapter 9, and look at what happens to him. But the Lord said, go for Saul. He is my chosen instrument to take my message of the Gentile and to kings, as well as the people of Israel. And I will show him. Okay, first part. It's hopeful. Go get Saul. I've chosen him, and he's going to take my message to the nations. He's going to talk to kings. Hopeful. But it's painful. For you will show him how much he must. He who God, anyone that God uses greatly, will 
on this side of eternity suffer deeply. I know we don't like that. But if you want to be used greatly by God, point to anyone in the New Testament that doesn't suffer for the cause. John's boiled alive, thrown on an island in isolation. Thomas is rumored to have been killed and martyred in India. Jesus' half-brother James is, is rumored in legend to be thrown off the top of the temple for not denouncing Christ. He survived the fall with broken legs and they beat his face in and killed him. That's the belief of it. You, you don't get out of the 12 disciples anyone that's either not a betrayer or a martyr. It was hopeful, but it was painful. Look at what he goes on to say. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Look what he goes on to say. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. We can call that unusual. <laughs> All right? This is my point. When God moves, it's not the way that you would normally do it. What's, what's God's process in moving Saul forward to becoming Paul? You're going to be blind. You're going to wait. I'm going to send someone that's scared to death of you that I'm going to have to convince <laughs> that they need to come. They're going to come and lay their hands on you. When they pray over you, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit, and you're going to receive your sight again, and you're going to see the world differently. You see, it was hopeful, it was painful, and it was unusual. Let, let me get back to the story. So she goes to the Lord because she doesn't know what's going on with her family. Some of you don't know what's going on with your family. Go to the Lord. He who lacks wisdom must ask of God who gives freely. James, like, go to the Lord, okay? Then we read this. Look at what it says. They're unique and they're different. The first one was very red, verse 25, and covered with thick hair like a fur coat, so they named him Esau. Then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so they named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when he was born. Look at what it goes on to say. As the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. Anybody relate to Esau? Hunters. Everything's protein and food. Anybody out there? You're afraid to grunt in church. That's okay. You, you're still getting in touch with your emotions. But I bet you were, you were pretty loud the last time you dropped a deer. You didn't go, hmm, yeah, that's a good deer. <laughs> so don't come in the presence of my God and tell me you're not emotional. Because, I mean, if you're in the deer stand going, Woo! You, 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 you've got more praise in you than you're given. not an emotional person. No, you're emotional in places that matter momentarily. I'm just, I don't have time for that. It just drives me crazy. These are the arguments that I have with husbands in this church. And I'm just like, mm, you're like, stand up and raise your hands and worship God. And you're like, I, I, not, it's not, not me. It's not my thing. No, it is your thing. You just celebrate the death of deer, not the living, <laughs> reigning God. <laughs> Died for you. I mean, no big deal. Isaac, verse 28, loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game. Esau brought home, uh, that Esau brought home, but Rebecca loved Jacob. Rebecca loved Jacob. This is the tension. They have two children, shocker, who are not the same. And the problem with that is they decide they're going to take sides. And there's a difference between loving your children uniquely and loving them in a divisive way. And it's a fine line, and I get the kids are always going to accuse you of loving one over the other, and that's, it's not up to them to determine. But it is your job to understand that God did not give you carbon copies. You do not have the same kids. They do not have the same interests. They do not have the same talents. They do not have the same weaknesses. And you cannot parent kids the same way. Each kid requires different parent styles, different parental habits, different parental practices. And you've got to be intentional about identifying where to encourage and where to discipline each kid that God has given you. They are a blessing that has come from the Lord. But they are not something that you are to use to divide your family into sides. Your kid is not there so that you can relive what you didn't accomplish or achieve in your teenage years. Don't force them into being what they are not. If they're not gifted, gifted athletically and they love theater, then get your butt into the theater and get excited about it. My father taught me one of the most beautiful lessons that he could ever teach me as a dad when I was a teenage son. 
My dad was not a big basketball player. He loved baseball. I was naturally gifted at baseball and had burnt out on it by eighth grade, and I'd fall in love with basketball, with baggy pants, and rap music. <laughs> my father could not have been further from any of those things in his loves. But you know what my dad did? He showed up to every game and cheered. He watched NBA draft night with me and threw a party with me at the house with he and I and hung out with me, not because he was interested, but because he knew I was interested in it. He took the time to take into account the things that I enjoyed and the things that I liked. Now, he also gave me some wise counsel around anyone not named Coolio that I listened to that was a rapper. But we would jam to Coolio in the car together. <laughs> Come along and ride on the fantastic ride, slide, slippity slide. Like, My sister was the complete opposite. She loved cheerleading. My father could care less about cheerleading. But she was passionate about it, tumbling and turning and throwing people in the air and concussions and broken backs and all that kind of stuff. And <laughs> so did my dad have cheer, a cheerleading shirt for her team on? Was he in the middle of the crowd hooping and hollering and yelling? Absolutely. You know why? Because these were the interests and talents and gifts that God had given his daughter, and he was going to support and back and encourage those things. My dad does not love me and my sister the same, but he does love us in equal value, and I have confidence in that because of the way that he, wrote, he, he parented and, and led us to, uh, and, and raised us up. Now, here, here's my point. It's okay to acknowledge that you naturally connect with one kid over the other. Not to them, but to you. You need to acknowledge that more than likely, there is a kid that you connect with and a kid that you struggle to connect with. So it's normal that the kid that is more or less like you, depending on what they are more or less like, is the one that you naturally or with ease connect with. Shared passions and interests, just like with friendships, naturally build relationships with kids who share in those interests. The point of this is to acknowledge it and to work to engage the kid who is different and more difficult to connect with with intentionality. Okay, me and Luke do not struggle to connect. He likes sports. I like sports. He likes to wrestle and body slam each other in the, in the room. I, I, I like to pick him up and body slam him and put every WWE move that I never got to put on anybody on him with, with, with safety. Okay, don't, don't, don't call DSS on me, all right? Like, I ain't got time for that. Like, with safety. I let him win every now and then. We figure four leg lock each other. We choke slam each other into the couch. It's fun. It, property's broken. My wife cries. It, it's okay. My, my, my point my point is, it's easy for me to connect with Luke. My daughter loves theater. She just wrapped up her first playbill, and I have to be intentional about engaging with her. She doesn't know this yet. She's probably watching it, but we decided that uh, Wicked, which is not a play about evil, it's a play about the other. Some of you are like, oh, you're going to Wicked. Oh, my gosh, that's not Christian. Okay, like, settle down, Karen, okay? <laughs> Calm down. Like, it's a great play. It's written about the other side of the Wizard of Oz. We're taking her to go and see it. Why? Because she's interested in it. And it's way more expensive than anything I've done with any of my children ever in the history of my life. But she's into that, and we want her to be engaged and get to go and experience those kinds of things. I have to work with intentionality towards it. Why? Because we're different, but I still love her. I want God's best for her. I pray over her every night just like I do my other two kids. So know that you'll naturally connect with one, which means you need to be intentional sometimes towards the others. I found this quote from a family blog. It says, if we're not careful, the child who matches up best with our own personality and preferences may get more or more of the best of us while our other children get less. Don't let that happen. Number two, you must be proactive in loving and pursuing your kids. You've got to be proactive in loving and pursuing your kids. If you have a kid that is requiring a lot of correction, make sure to seek out interaction that is non-corrective during those seasons. Right now, my eight-year-old son requires daily, sometimes minute by minute, hour by hour, correction. So the other night, we've been working through school. His little ADD behind cannot pay attention for more than 30 seconds. And so, like, we'll study, and he's going to kill it in a test, and then he goes in and does anything but get killed by the test. So the other day, he comes home, he's made two A's. It's a school night. You know what we did? We went and got ice cream because we wanted to reward and all of the correction and all the, why are you not doing better? To, to, to get, <laughs> I know that's not the best parenting moment, okay? I'm, I'm not telling you I've got highlights. I'm telling you I've got lowlights and you can do the opposite. But, 
But, but in that moment, in that moment of a lot of correction, I wanted to make sure he knew, like, hey, hey, we celebrate you. You've worked hard. We are proud of you. We see the progress. Like, like we want to make sure that we are spending time intentionally, proactively loving and pursuing our kids. Finally, number three, give your kids the freedom to be unique. Give them the freedom to be unique. Don't divide them in your love. Let them be who they are. I mean, that, that, that may look like for you cheering a theater performance on a Friday and yelling and screaming as he gets a home, as another kid hits a home run on a Saturday. That, that, that may look different kid to kid and season to season and what it costs for. But at the end of the day, don't let your love become a division in your family between your kids. And if you have, there's grace. There's grace. You have a God that has modeled for you what this unmatchable, constant love looks like, and his desire is that you would experience it so that you could extend it. For some of you right now, you could be experiencing shame instead of experiencing the grace of God's love. His desire is that you would experience his love. Why? Because he wants to give you a love that you can extend. If you've not experienced that, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, then we want to invite you to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, as Romans chapter 9 says, that Christ Jesus was raised from the dead and as a result of it received the free gift of his salvation, which is, which is his love in action for you. And if you need that this Christmas, we invite you to come forward during this time of prayer. If you need to pray for your family, we invite you to bend your knee in prayer. But as we move forward, my plea to you is that this Christmas you would see God restore your family, not divide it. You would see God at work in your family, not absent from it. And in your waiting of the promises that he's spoken over your family, he would find you faithful in the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Prayer team, you come. Let's stand to our feet. You respond as the Lord leads.